And good evening to everyone. Nice to see you here this evening. And tonight we'll worship according to the order of service as we have it in our bulletins tonight. And we'll begin by singing our first hymn, hymn number 415, Be Still My Soul. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. And please be seated for our readings. And our first reading for tonight is recorded in the book of Isaiah, the 56th chapter, verse 1, and then 6 to 8. This is what the Lord says. Protect justice and carry out righteousness. Because my salvation is coming very soon. My righteousness is ready to be revealed. Then the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord and to become his servants, every one of them who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, those who take hold of my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain and I will make them glad in my house of prayer. 
Their whole burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples of the world. This is the declaration of God the Lord, who gathers Israel's dispersed people. I will gather still more people to my house besides the one I already gathered. Here ends our first reading for this evening. Now we'll sing our psalm of the day, Psalm 133, 34. And our second reading for tonight is recorded in the book of Romans, the 11th chapter, verses 13 to 15, and then 28 to 32. I am speaking to you Gentiles, for as long as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I am going to speak highly of my ministry. Perhaps I may make known my own people jealous, and to save some of them. For if their rejection meant the reconciliation of the world, What does their acceptance mean other than the dead coming to life? In regard to the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but in regard to re-election, they are especially dear for the sake of the patriarchs, because God's gracious gifts and call are not regretted. For just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy due to their disobedience, so also now they have become disobedient so that by the mercy shown to you, they may be shown mercy too. For God imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he might show mercy to all. Here ends our second reading for this evening. And as the custom, please rise for the reading of our gospel. And the holy gospel for tonight is recorded for us in the 15th chapter of the gospel of St. Matthew, the verses 21 to 28. Jesus left that place and withdrew into the region of Tyre and Sidon. There a Canaanite woman from that territory came and kept crying out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. A demon is severely tormenting my daughter. But he did not answer a word or a word. His disciples came and pleaded, Send her away because she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt in front of them, saying, Lord, help me. He answered her, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, yet their little dogs also eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, 
your faith is great, it will be done for you just as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Here ends our gospel reading for this evening, and please be seated. And tonight we'd like to ask a very important question. In fact, it's the most important question that's ever been asked in all the history of the world. It's a question that was asked by our Lord Jesus Christ, so it deserves our undivided attention. It's a question of values, and its net worth is more than anything else in the whole wide world. And this is a question of our Lord Jesus Christ, the question he asks, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, before we begin to answer that question, we should make sure we know what the word soul really means. Some people here believe that the soul, the word soul should be translated as life, and that's the way some versions of the Bible translate it. But then we would have something like this. Then we'd have something that's completely meaningless, really. The question then would be, what if a man gained the whole world and loses his own life? I don't think that would make too much sense. Jesus here, however, was thinking about something else. <clears throat> thinking much more deeply when he asked this question, he was, his was the biblical thought that a man's soul is more moral, spiritual, never dying part. And there is no doubt that that's what he was talking about when he talked about his soul. Yes, what good will it mean be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? In St. Mark's Gospel, the question reads like this, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? In Matthew's Gospel, it says, What good will it be if a man gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? In Luke's Gospel, it reads like this, For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself? Lose himself. The soul, you see, is a real self. The real you and me, the soul. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about the soul, and I'm sure that we probably would never understand a whole lot about it if God even tried to explain it to us. I don't understand it, and I'm sure you don't understand it either. But all we can say is this. It's a part of us which loves, hopes, prays, believes, sins, repents, and can be eternally saved and eternally lost. There is nothing more important than the soul. You know, put it to every test and it always comes out in front. Put it to the test of subtraction. Take away the soul and then what do you got? Then you have nothing more than an animal. Then you're no better than the dog or pet cat you have at home or the, the, um, the animals down at the zoo. You're, no, zoo. you're no better than any of them. Take it away and that's what you got. Take the soul away and that's what you have. Or also, there is nothing more important to soul. How about the purpose of life? Why are we here? What's the meaning of this life anyway? What would life be without a soul? The question is often asked. Unfortunately, most people answer this question like, like Shakespeare answered with Macbeth in one of his plays. He described the meaning of it all like this. He said, life is but a walking shadow a poor player that struts and, and frets up his hour upon the stage and then goes out and uh, is heard no more. It's a tale told by an idiot full of wrath and fury, sound and fury, signifying nothing, signifying nothing. If life is just a time to work and sweat and suffer and die, and that's all, then I think it's all a big, cruel, and horrible joke. Take the soul away, and then what you have? Confusion, pain, no purpose at all. Another test we can test it by is the test of endurance. Over the three doors of the beautiful Milan Chapel are three symbols and three inscriptions. Over the door on the left are roses, and the words, that which pleases is only for a moment. Over the door, or the door on the left, right, are the thorns and the inscription, that which troubles is only but for a moment. 
And over the center, <clears throat> there is a cross. And these words, that alone is important, which endures forever. That alone is important, which endures forever. The soul is important because it endures forever. The highest test of anything, however, is the cost of something, what somebody is willing to pay for it, what somebody has done for it. And just to think about what was done for the soul of man. Something so great, so wonderful was done for the soul of man that when Jesus died there on the cross, a great earthquake rocked the world. The sun hid its face in shame. That's the value of your soul. Your soul was so valuable that it took the death of God's own son to redeem it. That's how important it is. And that really explains what it's all about. Life is all about. You can read all the books in the world by all the philosophers, anthropologists, philosophers, psychologists, and so on, and you'll never really run across a good reason why we're here. Not really. Why are we here anyway? You just can't explain us apart from the soul. You can't explain all the tears and fears, the hopes and dreams, the joys and heartaches of people. You just can't explain these things without a soul. Today, that most wonderful part of us, the soul, the most wonderful part of us, the soul is subject to abuse and neglect. How many of us today thought about our souls? I have to admit, I, if I wouldn't read through this and didn't have my sermon, I probably wouldn't think about it either. How many of us today have thought about our souls? How many? Your soul is a real forgotten person, isn't it? Forget about our souls. Who gives much thought to the soul? It's forgotten today in education. What place is the soul given in public grade schools, high schools, universities? Probably none. They get the mind and the body, but they don't educate the soul. That's why it's so important that we have a school here, Sunday school and all the other educational facilities that we have here to bring your children so that they might be educated properly in the souls, be, be educated. And adults, that also applies to us too. That's why we come to church and read our Bibles at home and read good religious literature. It's not only our children, but also all of us, too, that needed to be reminded daily that we have a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Daily reminded of that is the most important thing in the whole wide world. In addition, it's also sad to say that the souls are neglected in most churches today as well. A great portion of the church has found something better than do to the saved souls. That is, if they even believe if they even believe in the existence of a soul. A lot of them don't. Many churches today are more interested in socialist issues and issues dealing with the soul, more interested in feeding the body than feeding the soul, more interested in the social gospel than the gospel that can save souls. That explains why one prominent Lutheran theologian writes the following, and I think I got this out of Pastor Smith's book. You remember Pastor Smith? He's a member of Peace out here. He says this. He says, he quotes this guy as saying, in recent years, especially under the impact of renewed listening to biblical documents, the idea of an immortal soul becomes increasingly suspect. In other words, I don't think this guy believes in it anymore. Or in other rights, death puts an end to our total existence, body, soul, and everything. That's the way some people think these days about the soul. We cannot impress upon you enough the importance of the soul. And think about the soul, you have to go all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to Adam and Eve. God made man in his own image. The Bible says that God breathed into nostrils, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. But then something terrible happened. Something terrible. The soul was lost. 
And of all the teachings of the Bible, I would guess this is the one that's held up to more ridicule than anything else. The teaching of original sin. Wrong down there, don't we? Something wrong. Basically, wrong down human beings. A writer knowing that something's basically wrong with human beings once said, uh, kind of, uh, he said basically wrong. He said, where is the fall? He might as well take me to Mount Everest and say, where is the mountain? In other words, you have to be not to see that there's something wrong right down within us all. So we can see that there's something wrong, man's soul. Something, of course, is sin. That alone accounts for all the terrible things we see in the day, including the voice. That accounts for all the problems Separate nations, it's the start of wars. People centered in sin. It's sin that separates people from one another and certainly separates them from God. As one person rather crudely puts it, he says, It's sin that has changed man from God's temple into nothing but an outhouse. How true that is, right? With the fall of man, we were lost, doomed, condemned. It's a tragedy to fall into sin. But that's what brought our Lord Jesus Christ into this world. That's why he came in the fullness of time, born of the Virgin Mary. That's why he suffered in Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead from the dead why he did it all claim our souls here Jesus asked two questions about the soul and some think they're the same but really they're different they really pay attention to what he's saying here again he says this he says what good will it be if a man gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul and the second question is this, or what can a man give in exchange for his soul what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, the first one is pretty easy. What good will it be if a man gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? That answer is pretty easy. Everyone recognize the importance of the soul. No, that would be a pretty bad bargain. The other question is different. Jesus asks, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus did not ask, what did man take for his soul? He would take um, peanuts for his soul. He knew how little they would take, a little honor, a little power, a few dollars, a moment of comfort, a moment of pleasure. All these things people are willing to give, give up for their soul, take for their soul. A man will sell his soul, like we said, for peanuts. He'll sell it cheap, just like Esau sold his birthright. Jesus did not ask that. Listen very carefully. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? After he sinned and dirtied it, made it filthy, betrayed and sold himself, how can he get his soul back? No one can answer that, but only one. And that again, that's why our Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, so that we might be given back our soul on Calvary's cross when he died for you and for me and for all. One person put it this way. The scene is the courtroom and the judge is on the throne. The judge is God. Here comes a man trying to get back his soul and so he brings forth all his tears and he says, here are my tears just as the tears like Peter shed that night when he went out and wept bitterly here are my tears. Now, you, now you've got to give me back my soul. And the judge on the throne said, that's not enough. And then he said, here is my remorse, just as deep as the remorse of Judas. I'm so remorseful, so sorry. 
Now you've got to give me back my soul. And the judge on the throne said, that's not enough. Then he said, here are all my good things I've ever done, all the good works that I've ever done, and how good I've been during my life. Now you've now you got to give me back my soul. You've got to give it back. And the judge on the throne said, that's not enough. Then we saw somebody approach the throne of God, the judge with a vial in his hand, and the judge asked, what do you have there? And the man said, the blood of Jesus Christ shed for the world and also for this man. And all the angels in heaven shouted out, now give him back his soul. Christ died for you to give you back your soul, redeemed body and soul, not with gold or silver like the Bible says, but with the holy precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's what it took to get back your soul. And now you've been elevated to be one of God's own dear child, children. How happy we should be for that. We are one of his own. Your heavenly Father has given us back our souls washed pure and clean in the blood of Christ. What good will it be if a man gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? When Jesus asked that question, he was really talking about temptations you see every time, every day, probably every hour. We'll be tempted to trade our soul for something that this world has to offer. I think they would all think that would be a bad art market, wouldn't we? That would be the worst thing we could ever do. But the temptations are out there every day to trade our souls for something this world has to offer. They're there. May God grant that we will always realize just important how important our souls are. May we thank him for what he's done for our soul and may out of gratitude for what he has done for our souls vow here that we will serve him body and soul, both here in time and hereafter in eternity. Amen. And please rise and we will confess our Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And you have the note in your bulletin about the offerings, and uh, I don't think I have to repeat that, but there's an offering basket, I would think, in the back of the church. And uh, you're also welcome to give your, your uh, offerings uh, online, too. And so uh, you, you may be seated, then we'll go to the prayer of the church on page 6. O Lord, our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let the comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. 
give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry, arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Give us teachers and students who pursue excellence. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. And hear us, Lord, now as we bring you our private petition. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught, with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. And then we'll join together and pray the Lord's Prayer, and I believe that the custom is usually rise for the Lord's Prayer here. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord our God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth, Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. And we'll close our service by singing our last hymn, hymn number 238. Oh, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And thank you for joining us tonight. I don't have any other announcements unless somebody else has any announcements. Anybody? Any other announcements that you know of? I don't see anybody, so everybody have a very nice evening. I can't greet you at the door, of course, but maybe I can greet you outside after a bit here if you're still around, so maybe we'll do that. Okay, everybody have a very nice evening. Thank you.